careful. And finally, uh, I would say that if we really are serious about international negotiations, we must have a meaningful articulation uh, of our notion of equity, and this is one possible framework. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Shrikant. Um, it was wonderful listening to you, and uh, we've grappled with another NAMA in the WTO, and it seems that we <laughs> will be grappling with one NAMA here as well. Uh, before I open up the floor, um, I'll just quickly summarize uh, from our point of view, what are the things that we are looking at? We are obviously looking at, uh, we, we need these technologies. Where are the technologies going to come from? Who is going to finance it? And how are we going to set ourselves those targets on which we can achieve these low carbon transitions? Um, so with that, uh, the floor is open. Uh, please identify yourself and uh, be brief. Thank you, Chair. I'm uh, Lefinjal Malik. I did my doctorate on international, uh, the place of uh, military strength in international affairs. I was, used to be in the Executive Council of IDSA. Uh, the talk of uh, Professor Shilkant was music to my ear because he talked of geopolitics. I'm possibly the only soldier here. Uh, in my page, I found that uh, not much work has been done on economics of conflict. Ikriar, thankfully, did some work when Arvind Virumani was here, talked about the power potential and how, and the tripolar world, and that the potential that we can reach. That all is connected with geopolitics, and that all is connected with economics of conflict. Just to give the idea uh, to the audience here, Please uh, direct your question. At no, it's not a question. Oh, it's, it's a comment. And uh, is, I'm just uh, supporting the point that Shrikant has, uh, has said, that we are not quite appreciating the geopolitics of it all. Why we are being forced into a position and why we should take that on board now in our planning. Because if we don't do, uh, you'll find that we'll be uh, uh, hemmed in for various reasons and will not be able to reach our power potential. Just last thing I want to uh, just give some idea of the, uh, the numbers in war. 2002 Indian Pakistan came very close to fighting a war. The mere getting on the border cost the, both the economies 2% of the GDP. Today uh, the forces that are there in uh, uh, in Chiachin area. The fact that they are not withdrawing, I mean, you can keep calculating what it is costing uh, and how much will it cost in terms of the environment. So point Thank is that geopolitics you. part yep. needs to be studied a little more deeply. Sure, Thank your you. point is well taken. Uh, other questions? Yeah, I am uh, Commander Kapil Narula. I work at the NMF. So General Malik, you have some company and a uh, soldier form. I lead the... Uh, Energy and Environment Initiative at the Indian Navy. And uh, I have a few questions. Uh, to Dr. Duvash, uh, based on your article on the 23rd, uh, where you have talked about India, uh, sorry, the US and the China coming together in form of uh, a possible collaboration on emissions, uh, won't un India be isolated in the international community? And uh, what are the responses in which India is preparing itself for such an uh, eventuality? Uh, the second issue is I don't understand why is there a dichotomy in our approach. On one hand, India has committed. Uh, India is not ready for giving any commitment on emissions in the uh, world uh, negotiations. And on the other hand, it has adopted national uh, targets. So uh, the, the question is that uh, possibly politicians or a government has not actually imbibed the principle that uh, and it's looking more at short-term gains rather than long-term benefits and this was aptly been pointed by Himanshu in the in the presentation that uh, mitigation now is or changing the policies now will, will be much more beneficial in, in, in economic terms 
Thirdly, a question to uh, Dr. Shrikant Gupta. Uh, sir, price signals, there are no price signals in India. And uh, we know that uh, demand, elasticity of demand for electricity is not there. I mean, it's inelastic. And therefore, uh, your option or your uh, suggestion of uh, suggesting market mechanisms for India, uh, we have seen how the electricity market functions in India. And it's based on the hypothesis that it's an efficient market. But that is not the case in India. And therefore, uh, any such uh, assumption that markets will work is uh, possibly not valid. <coughs> it's limited in its uh, approach. Lastly, uh, la one last point is um, on the uh, modeling assumptions that we are basing our uh, inputs or our uh, modeling on per capita emissions. Suppose in the negotiations, it is on not on per capita emissions, but on overall emissions. Then what is the reaction of India? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, um, this is Jitesh from EcoFirst. Um, I have a question for Himanshu. Um, Himanshu, we are talking about this mathematical stuff, a lot of assumptions. Uh, 2050, 2047, 100 years of independence and all. If we start working backwards, we need to do three cities every year to reach there. How is it going to happen? When are we going to start moving from theory to actual real business on the ground? When do you think it's going to happen? Thank you. Any more? Yeah, this is Anirbha and Ganguly. I have a couple of questions for Himangsu. The first one is that uh, in the model, is there any way to look at the impacts on issues of distribution, poverty, etc.? So while you compute, you know, emission uh, reductions uh, in various pathways, uh, how does that uh, impact indicators of development, uh, distribution, etc.? So is there a way to look at that? And the second uh, question is that uh, how does the model factor in, uh, into it the issues of lifestyle and issues of aspirations? Now, it was said that you know, it's calibrated against a certain GDP target. But uh, if you look at, say, as an example, the issue of moving from uh, cars to public transport, I would say it's as much a lifestyle aspiration issue and the desire to match you know, certain global or whatever standards and along with being a carbon emissions issue. So does that model uh, take into account this factor as well? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, we'll have the first set of uh, answers. Uh, so will be right. Second round. OK, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for those questions. I'm tempted to respond at least as much to my panelists as to the questions, but I'll, I'll, I'll perhaps resist the temptation, unless you think that that's, uh, we can give ourselves a little leeway. Um, or I'll just do what panelists normally do and pretend that, uh, you know, that's embedded in the question from the audience is actually uh, a point that I can respond to the panel. Okay. Um, the question about, let me just take the direct question about um, uh, this uh, note that I, this op-ed that I wrote and uh, US and China. The Geopolitics was very much sort of latent in the presentation I tried to uh, put out there. And part of the point that I think is important to note is that we are operating in a context where the geopolitics is shifting. And uh, the US and China have been in discussion for quite a while. At the end of the day, those two countries contribute about 40, 45% between them of global annual emissions, not cumulative emissions. Some of Srikant's data is also a little bit old. The per capita emissions of China are now up to the level of some of the EU countries. So the per capita story for China is, is, is not as robust. It, they are, they are, they are. Um, the, like no, no, no. <laughs> but the Chinese say their emissions are, anyway. The, histor the historic emission story still holds. The point is that China, the, the incentive structure for China I think is changing in the sense that China is now basically thinking of itself in sort of a G2 context. 
and in that context they are positioning themselves uh, to the point where taking on an absolute emission cap is not going to be very damaging to their economy. They're leaders in the renewable energy arena. They have a very inefficient economy in that their energy intensity is actually much higher than ours, so they could take on quite stringent intensity limits and not damage their economy. Their situation is very different from ours. Their GDP is much, much higher uh, than, than India's. So their situation is very different, and they do not want to be in the front lines of being uh, called uh, to account for climate change. So there has been speculation for a while that the US and China will agree between themselves on a ceasefire. In other words, the US will say, here's what we will do, and you, China, will say that's reasonable, and China says, here's what we will do, and you, the US, will say that's reasonable. I think that moment is very, very soon. Uh, already the US has put out this new um, uh, 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 sort of approach of its power plants, which is which is which is probably the most serious effort that they have made. It's been gauged against a relatively low threshold, and China basically made an announcement that they would quite so shortly be capping their emissions, and then quickly it was contradicted by another official, which is a time-tested way of floating a trial balloon and seeing the reactions. Right? They have already uh, uh, um, put in place pilot emission trading programs in their provinces, uh, which require a cap. So I think what will happen is if, in the, if, if the US and China in fact cement this, then the next largest source of absolute emissions is India. We do not want to be then thinking about what to say. We need to be ready with what we say now, and ideally we need to be saying it now. In not, now, that does not mean that we take on unilateral mitigation, blah, blah, blah. No, not at all. But we need to be very clear what our strategy is in the context of a likely US-China uh, deal. And we need to be very clear with our data, our analysis of our future emissions trends, so that, we are, so that what we say meets those two objectives that I was talking about earlier, both contributing to a global climate deal, but also not limiting uh, our emissions. I think that's the world we, we operate in. Let me just make one quick comment uh, in response to Shrikant. In an ideal world, Shrikant, it would be nice to have a cap-and-trade system, which is that first uh, side of uh, the trilemma that I put out, a cap-and-trade system based on an allocation of uh, uh, a carbon budget, which in turn is derived from uh, taking into account historical emissions. That would be lovely. I just don't think it's going to happen. And I think that, in fact, you're, you're, you said that you know the 0.7% hasn't happened in 30 years. You're quite right. But asking for this, or demanding this would be an even harder ask than that 0. .7. It's actually a lot more money on the table. If we didn't get 0.7%, you're not going to get this. And the, 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 the difference is that we have a moral argument. Now, we've talked about geopolitics. I'm afraid that morality by itself isn't going to sway geopolitics. Um, so, that's, so I just don't think that's... I, I think we have to engage with the negotiations as we see them. And as we see them, it is these intended nationally determined contributions, which, as you said, are NAMAs in another form. And how do we manage to move our interests? I'm not arguing against our interests. We have to take our interests forward, but we have to do it in the context that we face, the real context that we face, and this is that context. Just quickly onto the question of uh, which you put on regarding lifestyle choices and, and issues of distribution and poverty. Uh, this is uh, one thing which we admit is lacking in the current current tool. But in the version two, which we'll be launching two months or three months from now, uh, we'll be having uh, uh, we'll be giving choices to the user to play around. Let's say on around on issues of lifestyle and aspirations. For example, uh, instead of uh, uh, going through the entire GDP approach that is India wants to grow at 7% or 6%, or we'll say that what if every Indian has a mobile phone by this particular date? What if, if every Indian has a car by this particular date? Or what if every Indian has access to 24-7 electricity by this particular date? Now, what kind of growth paradigms it might throw up and the GDP will be an output of this model? So, this is the kind of uh, things we are trying to put in the words into. And and, and mind this is an ever-evolving tool, so it doesn't end up in a report or so. So we are currently at Windows 98, and we plan to go to Windows 2008 in the next two or three years. Uh, that is one. And on the issue of what we need to do, I think uh, I am not authorized to talk about that. My seniors will be able to talk about you know, what policy uh, measures government needs to take to implement all the uh, recommendations coming out of the model. But 
Uh, since everyone has been a devil, devil's advocate around this panel, so I would want to take my turn as well. Uh, uh, it's I've been a technocrat by heart, you know. Uh, I worked on circuits and and technologies for that matter back in college, and I still fancy working on that. Unfortunately, I've been dragged around, you know, working on these models and learning about economics and and finance and stuff. Uh, one one key thing which actually uh, amazes me around this entire climate change debate uh, happening across the world is. The, is the focus on technology and sort of under, underestimating, uh, you know, the, the the prowess of India in terms of technology. Now, I'll give you two examples. One is of myself and another, another one of my friend. So back in third year, myself, I worked on a climate adaptation technology in my back in my college days. So in West Bengal, you'll you'll see our college is you know is situated around the river Hooghly, and and uh, we we've been seeing uh, increased precip precipitation around that area, and so a lot of flooding and of the nearby paddy fields. So we, we worked, a couple of, three of us, uh, IIT Kharagpur was, was actually commissioned to work on that. And we developed a, you know, a low cost uh, mechanical uh, paddy transplanter, you know. So and then farm, the paddy field farmers around that area, they find it really difficult to sort of plant their paddies in the waterlogged areas. So it decreases the yield by more than 30% and 35%, right? So what we, and, and, and the electrical transplanters, paddy transplanters, which, which come from Germany and stuff, they cost 10 lakhs and so. So we, we were able to develop that paddy transplanter in just 3,000 bucks from scrap. And so one, all ne one needs to do is drag it along and the paddy transplanter will plant paddies at the parallel distance. So increasing the yield of the area by more than 20%. So this is one. And second, second example I would like to give you is, is one of my best friend who is working on a climate mitigation technology. You know, He has patented two technologies on uh, <laughs> sort of capturing uh, carbon dioxide from flue gases, and is and and the irony is uh, he has gotten funding from uh, U.S. government. He has got gotten funding from U.K. government, and he hasn't got gotten even a single rupee of funding from Indian government, for that matter. And he's he's opened two he's opened two offices, uh, one in London, one in New York. He's employing, of course, uh, Britishers in London and, and Americans in New York, and he's not employing even a single one person in India. So uh, the entire debate of Climate change, and imagine he is a he is just as a as a technocrat competing with the likes of Toshiba's and Mitsubishi's in the national markets as far as climate mitigation technology is concerned. So my 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 takeaway is, while we are while we can negotiate, you know, we can de debate upon what's going to be asked and 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 how much finance needs to come from the developed countries to the developing country and so on and so forth. Why not look at climate change as an opportunity for India to expo export technologies? I think you should look next year. Uh, uh, yeah, so I'm not <laughs> looking at some first person. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I, don't, I, I still want to work on technologies. If you give me a million dollars, I'd be able to produce your technology instead of producing a model. So. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, well, just first, just for some of the specific questions, I think uh, the commander has uh, uh, certain facts uh, that you should be aware of. For example, you mentioned that there is an Indian position, an international Indian position, maybe not a codified position, but a former prime minister did say in a G20 meeting or what is it, G10 or one of these Gs that in, in, in Germany that our per capita emissions will never exceed those of the OECD countries. Now, you can't sort of, it's not a sort of a, a, a binding commitment, but there is a principle, and there I think I would totally disagree with uh, with my friend Navroz. That you know there is an articulated principle of contraction and convergence. The idea of contraction and convergence is that look, we if we need to reach some safe levels of global emissions, then the 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 emissions of the rich countries have to contract, and we converge to some sort of a uniformity. So the principle of contraction and convergence can be articulated as a principle of per capita contraction and convergence. And Prime Minister Manmohan Singh did say that in, uh, I can't pronounce the German Heidel game, he went to this meeting and he said it and you can look it up. So there is a, a notional sense of, of, of our targets. 
I won't, uh, uh, Commander, uh, uh, you're a brave man. You have commented on elasticities and efficient markets in, in, in electricity. I would not ever um, have the same bravery to, uh, to comment on your ships and your guns. But I would simply say that uh, it's not a question of elasticities in an Indian context. Firstly, there are notions of long run, short run elasticities. So we can have that as an offline discussion. Uh, we were talking about a global price signal and I think a price signal is, is very important. Right now we have a de facto, uh, de facto zero price on, on carbon emissions. Uh, on the geopolitics, uh, since I was the one who sort of brought that phrase in, so let me say that yes, um, um, again, Navroz uh, spends more time uh, doing that. I, I run models mostly, but the point is that yes, maybe uh, US and China will get together. Um, uh, the, the northern countries have had a historical, in, in India we are very familiar with this phrase divide and rule. And uh, to create a schism between the developing countries, so for example the African proposal that Navroz mentioned, now in the negotiations uh, India is on the back foot because the really, really least developed countries say uh, that well India talks about the right to develop but while you grow we perish. Uh, Lord Stern uh, uh, talks in very different tones in different parts of the world and uh, in different contexts uh, he has been saying India's right to grow doesn't mean India's right to pollute. So uh, there are all kinds of geopolitical issues. My point is to all of you just one simple thing. If we all agree that dangerous climate change has to be prevented by reducing our global emissions to half by a certain time frame. Uh, these uh, backroom deals between US and China and putting pressure on in India is not going to deliver it. In the end, a treaty has to be perceived to be fair for everybody to buy into it. And my own uh, view, and, and it's shared by some very eminent people, uh, um, uh, for example, uh, uh, the very eminent uh, former civil servant in Terry talks about this, that in the end, we will have some element of uh, effects of climate change. We all know that countries such as India are going to be impacted. So in that sense, is it uh, worthwhile to then be talking about switching all this or talking about adaptation? We have to climate proof our economy no matter what because climate change is going to happen. Now we can have all these global negotiations and the real politics. It's not going to save the world. And if the world's not going to be saved, uh, what is it in India's interest? So I think I will leave it at that and uh, Thank you. Uh, we'll have a quick second round of questions and wrap up. Thank you very much. I'm Dilip Sahai, uh, telecom sector. See, I would like the attention, not as a question, but of Dr. Rajat Kathuria, who mentioned in the beginning of the session that he's looking after some proposal from the Department of Telecommunication regarding the renewable energy. So I hope he will take uh, lessons or he has already taken a lesson from Dr. Sikant Gupta's uh, presentation and hopefully that will cover up the views that he's likely to express. Thank you very much. Dinesh Mohan from IIT Delhi. Some of you have present the, from the modeling efforts, and it's come up in, in the morning also, that one issue of in transport on increasing use of public transport. I think that's a very false idea. If we in, increase public transport in India, energy use will increase. Because the use of more personalized motor transport is so low, that the only way use of public transport will increase is people who are walking and cycling today. So increasing public transport in India, it maybe should happen, but it will increase use of energy in India. The, all your statistics regarding ownership of motor vehicles are complete rubbish. The actual number of motor vehicles in India, personal motor vehicles in India is about 50% of those officially registered. Because no motor vehicle ever goes off the records. I have four RCs and all those four cars are dead because I will not go to the motor vehicles office to have them removed and waste my time. 
that's one. Secondly, we are already putting in place transportation policies which increase energy use dramatically, like bullet trains. Will increase energy use by 10 times of the current trains. So the issue is, should Indians be saving two hours going, or one hour going from Mumbai to Ahmedabad, and increasing energy use eight times? Now, unless we are willing to talk about these issues seriously, and that goes with buildings. Your green code for buildings makes a seven-star hotel a green building. The amount of energy used in that hotel is 10 times more than mine per capita. So we have to start looking at what we should do in our country regarding energy use efficiently and cleanly. And the rest follows. Because once we talk about ener clean, cleaner energy use, ir irrespective of the source, and understanding that we will not have bioenergy in a country which has no water and no food, we, and so on and so forth. So I think these are very, very serious issues.